I worked at all full for five years. It's been a pleasure working with the Enter College of Nursing. I've grown professionally and gained lifelong friends. In particular, I am thankful to all the NCM coordinators who, who I work with. Sir Dino, Sir Vasquez, Ma'am Aida, Ma'am Aroma, and the late Ma'am Lorselli, who was the Dean of the College of Nursing. I was truly grateful that they provided me with a rewarding learning experience in a warm working environment. In 2013, I decided to work overseas. While waiting for my working visa, I, I enrolled in LSTI, Life Support Training Institute, and finished their courses, Basic Emergency Medical Technician and Pre-Hospital Trauma Care. I passed the licensure examination of the PSEMT, or the Philippine Society of Emergency Medical Technicians. I truly enjoy the course, gaining additional knowledge and skills. So for the knowledge of everyone, EMT stands for Emergency Medical Technician, also known as Ambulance Technician. EMTs provide out-of-hospital emergency medical care and transportation for critical and emergent patients who access the EMS system. They have the basic knowledge and skills necessary to stabilize and safely support patients ranging from non-emergency and routine medical transport, transports to life-threatening emergencies. After finishing the course, I was absorbed to work as their part-time instructor and simultaneously work as an emergency medical technician in the company Ambocare EMS Solutions, where I had my on-the-job training too. December 2013, I flew to KSA, where I got hired at, at Alhada Armed Forces Hospital. It's a military hospital in KSA under the Ministry of Defense Aviation, or MODA. It is a tertiary hospital with 569 bed capacity. It has been accredited by the Saudi Central Board for Accreditation of Healthcare Institution, or SIBAHI, and the Joint Commission International, or the JCI. So these are my colleagues in our unit. Here in Alhada, I was assigned as a staff nurse one in VIP unit. Our unit provides services to male and female of all ages, patients from higher ranking officials, their dependents and members of the royal family. It is a cross-functional unit catering to medical, surgical, pediatrics, obstetrics, and gynecology, trauma, and oncology patients. So as you can see, we have built a family. In 2017, I was assigned as an acting head of the unit. I also took part in various nursing educational activities. I actively participated as one of their resource speakers. So this was taken during the 2016, if I'm not mistaken, 2016 general nursing orientation. So I was with Ms. Stacy Cayetano. In the last quarter of 2019, Alhada Armed Forces Hospitals, Hospital enrolled in the program NDNQI, or the National Database of Nursing Quality Indicators, as the hospital is aiming for magnet recognition. So what is magnet recognition? Magnet recognition is a recognition program operated by the American Nurses Credentialing Center that allows nurses to recognize nursing excellence in other nurses. It is considered the highest recognition for nursing excellence. And part of the journey for, ma for magnet recognition or accreditation is having the NDNQI. What is NDNQI? NDNQI is the only national nursing database that provides quarterly and annual reporting of structure, process, and outcome indicators 
to evaluate nursing care at the unit level for use in quality improvement activities. In this fresh endeavor, I've chosen to be one of the team leaders for one of the indicators. So this picture was taken during the launching of the NDNQI at Alhada Armed Forces Hospital. On February, 20, uh, on February 2019, one of the stations of VIP unit, as, as I mentioned a while ago, I was assigned, I am assigned in VIP unit, and VIP unit has three stations, VIP A, VIP B, and VIP C. And the administration decided to convert the VIP A to male medical ward. Okay, male, med male medical ward to admit male patients with acute medical conditions. With the COVID-19 pandemic, our unit, our current unit, male medical tree, was decided to be one of the COVID units. Initially, we were terrified with the upcoming changes in our scope of service, mainly with the fact that we would be working at the front line facing an unknown enemy where the certainty of winning the battle is undetermined. Is there a single person in the universe not bothered with this novel coronavirus? the virus that has produced toll of deaths every day all over the world. COVID-19 has brought a lot of unprecedented challenges beyond our imagination for both people and society. For the first few months, the unit's patient census was low. That was the time that KSA was not stricken yet by this pandemic. Eventually, the outbreak has led to sharp increase in admission. KSA number of cases kept on rising that prompted our hospital to expand our bed capacity to open more ICUs for COVID-19 and to create a field hospital to accommodate more patients. As part of risk management, the hospital has made a new pathway for patient admission and for patient movement inside the facility during any transport. Due to shortage of staff, I was also assigned to work as one of the charge nurses. During the surge, it came to a point that we couldn't spare any minute to empty our bladder, to quench our tears, our thirst, and to fill our tummy even with a little amount of food. We bombarded with huge volume of admission and transfer in. Once a patient was confirmed positive, we were arranging transfer to Prince Mansour Military Hospital. This hospital has been designated to, to house only COVID-19 cases. In our unit, we have eight designated beds for positive cases who will be found not candidate for transfer. The unit's bed turnover rate was really fast. We have lots of RRT activation or the Rapid Response Team activation for our, for our patient who we found deteriorating. If it's observed that the patient is unmanageable in the ward, we, were tra we, we are transferring the patients to ICU. There were also moments of cold blue team activation. This is, activate this is activated for patients who already arrested due to COVID-19. So CPR, intubation, insertion of advanced airway are quickly initiated. Actually, it is depressing to witness patients struggling for their breathing. 21% of oxygen, as we all know, is just freely moving around. However, these COVID patients, despite its availability in the atmosphere, it's really hard for them to breathe in. What crippled us more is that more and more of my colleagues are getting ill. They were infected with COVID-19. It has aggravated our existing problem with staffing. As the numbers of infection and mortality cases surge, it has exhausted both our mind and body. This pandemic outbreak has been compromising our psychological well-being. Feelings of burnout, anxiety, depression, and fear are developing amongst us frontline healthcare workers. I have suffered from fear fears from infection and death, as well as uh, spread of uh, nosocomial infection or COVID infection to my loved ones. 
So this picture was taken in our uh, was taken in our unit. Uh, this one uh, is one of our internal medicine doctors. He is he was wearing pop R. And then uh, here we were having the N95 fit testing. In this battle, having them around me has made me stronger. They are my inspiration, my happiness, and my comfort place. Last July 2020, with God's grace, I was promoted to a head nurse, poti head nurse position. One thing I have learned, life is not about the destination, it's about the journey. It's not about any single accomplishment. It's about the cycle of continuous improvement or enhancement. It is ultimately recommended to the process that we will determine our progress. Rather than optimizing our life to the finish line, James Clear of Atomic Habits recommends and teaches to optimize our life for the beginning of our journey. If we have a system in place to keep us going, then that system and process will take us where we want to go. So now let's proceed to the next topic. COVID-19 clinical management. Okay, so COVID-19 as a disease caused by a new strain of coronavirus. Okay, CO stands for what? Okay, CO stands for corona. B stands for virus and B for disease. Formerly, this disease was referred to as the 2019 novel coronavirus or 2019 NCO. COVID-19 affects different people in different ways. Most infected people will develop mild to moderate illness and recover without hospitalization. So I will no longer discuss the signs and symptoms. So we will focus on the management of COVID-19, okay? So let's start with uh, management of mild COVID-19, symptomatic treatment, okay? So patient isolation. So it's recommended that patients with suspected or confer confirmed COVID-19 be isolated, okay? Be isolated to contain virus transmission according to the established COVID-19 care pathway. This can be done at a designated uh, healthcare facility or at home. Self isolation. Okay. Additionally, the decision may depend on the patient's clinical presentation, on the potential risk factor for severe disease, okay. um, requirements, of, requirements for supportive care, and also the conditions at home including the presence of vulnerable person. Next, antipyretics for fever and pain. Okay? So patients with COVID-19, they may have fever and body pain, so we can give uh, paracetamol. Question, can we give NSAIDs? Okay? Actually, according to WHO, at present, there is no evidence to indicate that there are severe adverse events in patients with COVID-19 as a result of the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay, so we must provide proper nutrition to patients and of course, appropriate rehydration since most of the patients or some of the patients may have diarrhea and vomiting. And counsel patients with mild COVID-19 about signs, okay. about signs and symptoms of complications that should prompt urgent care. Okay. So those patients who will be isolated at home, they should be counseled, they should be taught of the worsening symptoms. And if that occurs, they should uh, seek immediate care or urgent care.
Next, management of moderate COVID-19 pneumonia treatment. Empiric antibiotic treatment. As we all know, COVID-19 is a viral infection. However, in some cases, patients develop, uh, develop bacterial infection. Antibiotic treatment is not prescribed or is not recommended unless there is a clinical suspicion of a bacterial infection. And next, close monitoring of patients with moderate COVID-19 for signs and symptoms of disease, um, disease progression. Okay, so for hospitalized patients, patient must be moni uh, patient's vital signs must be monitored regularly and closely, especially the oxygen saturation. Okay. And also nurses must be aware of the early warning signs of deterioration. Management of severe COVID-19, severe pneumonia treatment. Okay. Immediate administration of, su of supplemental oxygen therapy. So for patients having an oxygen saturation of less than 90, he or she should be given with um, oxygen support, especially those patients, particularly those patients with emergency signs. The management of severe COVID-19, severe pneumonia treatment. Okay, so closely monitor for signs of clinical deterioration. Okay, actually in our unit we placed um, we placed Dynamap or BP monitoring or vital signs monitoring equipment in every room. So for us to closely monitor or regularly monitor our patients for any deterioration. Okay, so we must be aware of the signs of shock and then respiratory failure. Use cautious fluid management in patients with COVID-19. Okay? So fluid administration might be necessary for the patient, but uh, with caution to avoid fluid overloading. Management of critical COVID-19 acute respiratory distress syndrome. In selected patients with COVID-19 and mild ARDS, a trial of high-flow nasal oxygen, non-invasive ventilation like CPAP and BiPAP. Okay, CPAP or the continuous positive air pressure and BiPAP, the bi-level positive air pressure. Okay, these are non-invasive, uh, non-invasive uh, ventilation. Meaning, patient's airway is not secured with an EP tube. Rather, these modes of ventilation are delivered through a tight-fitting face mask. Patients must be awake and minimally sedated and able to take spontaneous, spontaneous breaths. Okay. And also, patients with hypoxic respiratory failure, hemodynamic instability, multi-organ failure, or abnormal mental status should not receive non-invasive ventilation, okay? So they should uh, be intubated. Management of critical COVID-19, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Prompt recognition of progressive acute hypoxic, hypoxemic respiratory failure, when a patient with respiratory distress is failing to respond to standard oxygen therapy and adequate preparation to provide advanced oxygen ventilatory support. Okay. So endotracheal intubation be performed by a trained and experienced provider using airborne precautions. Okay. Patients may continue to have increased work of breathing or hypoxemia even when oxygen is delivered by a face mask or with a non-rebreathing mask. A hypoxemic respiratory failure in ARDS commonly results from intrapulmonary ventilation perfusion mismatch or shunt and usually requires mechanical ventilation. 
in our uh, institution, we have the rapid response team. Okay, so rapid response team, it is like an emergency medical team. Um, the nurse, <clears throat> the nurse will activate the RR, uh, the rapid response team once he um, he observes the patient has deve is developing an is developing one of the early signs of deterioration. And this team will be attending the patient and then will be giving immediate or urgent care. So the patient might be transferred to ICU or might be managed in the unit or in the ward. Implementation of mechanical ventilation using lower tidal volumes and lower inspiratory pressures. Okay. So in addition, COVID-19 uh, up to this time is still under droplet precaution, contact and droplet precaution. However, if there is uh, aerosolization or there is a procedure that um, uh, an aerosol generating procedure, airborne precaution must be observed. Okay, so what are those aerosol generating procedures? Okay, we have the nebulization, we have the suctioning, we have the intubation, okay, and also the delivery of high flow oxygen. In adult patients with severe um, ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, prone ventilation for 12, to, for 12 to 16 hours per day is recommended. So proning. Application of prone ventilation is recommended for adult patients preferably for 16 hours per day and may be considered for pediatric patients with severe ARDS but requires sufficient human resources and expertise to perform safely protocols. Okay. Proning improves VQ or the ventilation perfusion matching and allows patient to have gas exchange along the posterior aspects of the lungs. And use a conservative fluid management strategy for ARDS patients. Manage of critical COVID-19 septic shock. Okay. So in case of septic shock, okay, res resuscitation in adults give 250 to 500 ml of crystalloid fluid as a rapid bolus in first 15 to 30 minutes. Okay. So crystalloids like the normal saline and the lactated ringers. In adults, administer vasop vasopressor resource when shock persists during or after fluid resuscitation. Prevention of complications in hospitalized and critically ill patients with COVID-19. Okay, number one, we have the thromboembolism. Actually, in our institution, we are extracting bloods either daily or every other day. It depends on the doctor's order. Okay, So they are monitoring, the doctors are monitoring the D-dimer, okay? the lab works, the CBC, the LFT, the ESR, for them to check if patient is developing complication, particularly the, thrombo, the thromboembolism. So if the D-dimer is high in this particular patient, they are providing um, enoxaparin or the clexane. So another um, complication, okay, we have the adverse effects of medication. Okay, so pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of the medication should be considered okay, when prescrib prescribing medication to COVID-19 patients. And other complications like the VAC or the ventilator-associated pneumonia, the Cauti or the catheter-associated urinary tract infection, club C or the central line-associated bloodstream infection, stress ulcers, pressure injury, antibiotic resistance. Um, these complications um, may develop 
among patients in the ICU who are hooked to ventilator, who are um, who are on uh, bedridden mode for quite a long time due to COVID-19. So some of them might develop stress ulcers, or if some of them have a central line, or a central line, they might develop the club C or the central line associated blood slip infection. Actually. For all, our, uh, for all COVID-19 patients, suspected COVID-19 patients confirm COVID-19, upon admission, um, it is a routine for, for us in our institution to extract labs, okay? to extract blood for lab works, to do ECG, to send the patient okay, to HRCT or the High Resonance Computer tom Tomography to check uh, the chest condition of the patient and also to do some cultures, blood cultures, sputum cultures to check for any bacterial infection. Antivirals, immunomodulators, and other adjunctive therapies for COVID-19. Chloroquine and hydrochloroquine, azithromycin, each can cause QT prolongation and taken together can increase the risk of cardiotoxicity. That's why some of our patients are referred to cardiology. Okay. Lopinavir, ritonavir. Okay, so this is an antiviral. The most common adverse effects are gastrointestinal. Remdesivir, the side effect is elevation of the hepatic enzymes, GI complications rash, renal impairment, and hypotension. Omifenovir can cause diarrhea and nausea. And then the favipiravir can cause Q2, uh, QT, sorry, QT interval prolongation. Okay. To date, there are no, okay, to date, there are no specific vaccines or medicines for COVID-19. Treatments are under investigation. Existing published literature on the agents listed is mostly observational in nature with few clinical trials and does not provide high quality evidence in favor of any of these agents. In addition, important side effects have been observed. And we have the interferon. Okay can cause pyorexia and rhabdomyolysis. Toxilizumab, URT infections, nasopharyngitis, headache, hypertension, increased alanine aminotransferase or ALT, and injection site reactions. And we have the plasma therapy. Corticosteroid therapy and COVID-19. Corticosteroid for a patient with COVID-19 and, and sepsis. Okay. So corticosteroids um, may, um, con uh, may help patients with COVID-19. However, the downside of this um, medication is that it can prolong the viral shedding Viral shedding, okay, the shedding of the virus in the chest of the patient as what they've observed in MERS or the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Okay, treatment of other acute and chronic infections in patients with COVID-19. Suspected or confirmed severe COVID-19, the use of empiric anti antimicrobials to treat all likely pathogens. Okay, so according to WHO, the new coronavirus is a virus and therefore antibiotics should not be used as a means of prevention or treatment. However, if you are hospitalized for 2019 NCOV, you may receive antibiotics since bacterial co-infection is possible. Okay, so management of neurological and mental manifestations 
associated with COVID-19. So delirium, okay? If detected, then immediate evaluation by a clinical, um, by a clinic, uh, if detected, then immediate evaluation by a clinician is recommended to address any underlying cause of delirium and treat appropriately. Prompt identification and assessment for anxiety and depressive symptoms. Okay, so for people who are experiencing symptoms of anxiety, psychosocial support strategies such as psychological first aid, stress management, and brief psychological interventions based on the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy should be considered. And for relieving anxiety, causing severe distress that is not responsive to psychological or psychosocial support strategies, benzodiazepines can be considered specifically in the hospital setting. Benzodiazepines should only be used with extreme caution with preference for those with shorter half-lives and lower risk of drug-drug interaction. So prompt identification and assessment for anxiety and depressive symptoms in the context of COVID-19 and to initiate psychosocial support strategies and first-line interventions for the management of new anxiety and depressive symptoms. Okay. So that is the end of my presentation.